still upon the same subject, perseverance of the saints. The text that I never really got to is Hebrews 5, verse 11 and following. This is it. Next week, we will return to John. Lord willing, we'll be there next week. I titled this section today because I think it is the nature of it, Dangerous Circumstances. Dangerous Circumstances. It's a book called Pilgrim's Progress. I read my Bible through every year. I read Pilgrim's Progress through every year. Um, it's good for you to do so. In Pilgrim's Progress, there is a place, a person by the name of Interpreter. Interpreter has a house. His house is located just inside Wicket, not Wicked, Wicket Gate, a narrow gate. So when you go through the Wicket Gate, this is the narrow way unto salvation. Interpreter's house is just on the other side. Interpreter's house is a local church. The interpreter is the pastor. In Pilgrim's Progress, it's the Christian or pilgrim who is the new Christian going to church. That's the scene. Now, there's another guy by the name of Mr. Worldly Wise Man. Now, his church is just a little off to the side, just past the gate of good wills. All these good intentions his church lays over there. It's a remarkably nice church. It's got all the bells and whistles. They even have a smoke machine, I'm sure. And they have all kinds of things. They have a large crowd over there. But they're devoid of exposition and verse-by-verse -verse exposition of the Word of God. They're not going to invite the interpreter to preach at Goodwill's church. It's not going to happen at Mr. Worldly Wiseman's church. These are separate places. The interesting thing about Interpreter's Church is this, that in his church he has many rooms, and all kinds of rooms there, and they're all fascinating rooms. And I'd encourage you to read that section at some point, pick up Pilgrim's Progress and read it, but it's fascinating rooms, and you go in the room, and he teaches you all kinds of things, and it's very picturesque, and you can follow the stories, and it's, it's really, really good. And so that's what happens, and that's what's supposed to happen in church. You've came, you come here today, and I'm supposedly the interpreter and the pastor of the local church. And um, this is our room. And I want to show you some things. And I hope that it would be like Christian. He goes to one room. He goes to two rooms. And he goes to three rooms. And he says something that nobody says anymore. He says, this has been profitable. Profitable. I would hope to pray that when you come to church and hear the word of God preached, that it's profitable for you. All we can say is good sermon, it was a great time. I want it to be profitable to you. But I don't want you to be like Christian in this regard. After about room three, Christian says something like this. Let me go hence. He's ready to move on. And interpreter says, no, don't move so fast. Hang on. I want to show you another room. And so he comes back and he shows him another room. And after he gets through with the other room, he says, Christian says, is it not now time for me to go on my way? We're always in such a hurry to do something big. As long as there's been humanity, a class that starts is full, is never full at the end of the class. Everybody wants in, but nobody stays to the end. You start a preaching class, it diminishes. You start a Bible study, it diminishes. You start a Wednesday night, it diminishes. Would you stay for one more room? Don't run off so fast. You might miss something. If the interpreter shows you a room, you don't want to miss it. Would say this before we get to the text. Familiarity breeds contempt. And pretending produces condemnation. Familiarity breeds contempt. Pretending produces condemnation. Now, the room that I intend to show you this morning is filled with people who have gathered for worship. They've been gathering for quite a number of years. 
in this place over a hundred and something years. They have been enlightened along the way. They have tasted of things along the way. They've even shared in the Holy Spirit along the way. But only some of them, some of you, have produced a useful crop. That's a blessing. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 11. About this, we have much to say. <clears throat> it's a bit hard to explain. But notice why the difficulty exists on the explanation. It's not because the truth is hard to understand. It's hard to explain since you've become dull of hearing. Now, dull of hearing is a Greek word that will come up again later in the passage. And later in the passage, they translate it differently. And the way they'll translate it is sluggish. You've become slow to hear. It's why it's difficult to explain to you another room because you've heard this preacher, this interpreter, for 20 years. And you get lazy in listening because it takes effort to connect the dots. And so you, you can become a, a bit dull of hearing. And he goes on. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you, again, the basic principles of the oracles of God. And this is not, this, this is a rebuke is what it is. You need milk, not solid food. For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled, undiscerning, uh, unable to differentiate, differentiate between truth and falsehood, unskilled in the word of righteousness. Why is it that there's no discernment in the church? Because they're still babies. Is this the word here? Child. Still infants. Spiritually, I'm going to make the case that they're unconverted. Verse 14. But solid food is for the mature. For those who have their powers of discernment trained. By, by what? Well, their constant practice to distinguish good from evil. Therefore, let us leave. It's time to move on. Let us leave this elementary doctrine of Christ. Let's go on to maturity, not laying again these basics, the foundation of repentance from good works, faith toward God, the instruction about washings or baptisms, laying on the hands, this setting apart of people, the resurrection of the dead, and the eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permits. By the way, we're not discounting, or we're not dismissing these things in one through three, these things we're going to move on from. But I will say this to you. If all the interpreter can give you is the basics of the gospel every Sunday, repent, believe, Jesus died and rose from the dead, glorious truths, amen, but if that's all you get your whole life, you'll never grow. There's a whole lot to the word of God. There's Genesis 1-1 all the way to Revelation 22, and the interpreter ought to show you all the rooms, amen. all of them. Yeah, it includes repentance and faith for sure. It includes baptism for sure. All these things are sure, surely to be preached and understood. But there's a lot more here that we're to be taught in order to grow, in order to be mature. And I'm making the case that the infant in this passage is unconverted. And I'm doing so only because of this. Because if there's no growth, there's no birth. If there's no growth... There's no birth. If you're born, you will mature. If you're born and don't mature, then you're 60 years old and somebody's microwaving your bottle and you're still sucking on it and it looks really bad. You, know, you see a room full of people in their 60s sucking on a bottle and somebody changing their diaper, you're like, something didn't work out right here. That's what he's saying. The writer of Hebrews is saying, if you're still an infant after 10 years in the interpreter's house, you're not born. Because if you are born, everything living grows. If it doesn't grow, it's dead. There's got to be growth. It doesn't mean that everybody's at the same level, but it definitely means that there's growth. Now, in this 5.11 through 6.3, Hearing impaired is in verse 11. They're sluggish in hearing, lazy in hearing. 
if you want a graphic illustration, are we done? Is it 12? Will he go for one minute or three minutes? I don't know how much longer I can put up with this. I'm already tired and he hadn't got through point one. We become sluggish rather than coming to church hungering and thirsting for righteousness so that we might be filled. And we start coming to church just out of a sense of duty where my conscience will feel better. Hearing impaired. They have not grown, verses 12 through 14. They ought to have grown, but they did not grow. In the text, now you can find fault with me and that's fine. We can talk about that another day. But in our text, the fault is not with God. The fault is not with the truth. The fault is not with the writer of Hebrews. The truth is being presented. It's being laid out before them in written form and even proclaimed form. But they're not growing. But the fault is not the word. It's not the truth. The fault lies upon the hearer because he's become sluggish and he's not willing to be attentive to the word and respond to it. Your growth is so absent, and this is literally the way the Greek word means. This is what it's saying. You've got to ask somebody, teach you again. Teach you what? Literally what he's saying here, if I can use the word literally, you're having to be taught the alphabet again. You went all the way through school, you graduated from high school, you went to college, you graduated from college, and we're like, now look, it's A, B, C, D. I can't even use sentences because we're back in kindergarten. That's, that's the rebuke he's giving them. You're gathering together, but we're still hanging out on the alphabet when we ought to be making some progress here. The warning or the danger of the circumstance for you individually is, are you making progress? Do you know the alphabet? Are you still waiting for the microwave to ding where you can suck on your bottle? Is there any growth happening in you? Do you know God better? Do you know the Word of God better? Do you have any more maturity? Do you have any more discipline? Can you tell what's true and what's false? Can you tell a charlatan from somebody that's real? Do you know what godliness is compared to worldliness? Are you making grow? As a husband, are you a better husband? Are you a better wife? Are you a better child? Are you a better school person? Are you a better worker on your job? Is there growth in you? Are you growing in wisdom and knowledge with God? Are you, are you sitting here after 20 years going, well, really, nothing's changed. That's an indictment upon you. You need someone to warm your bottle for you, but you have no desire for steak. I'm serious issues with people that don't like steak. <laughs> Paul says it differently in 1 Corinthians 3.1. I'm not saying Paul wrote Hebrews. I'm not saying anything about who wrote Hebrews. I'm just saying Paul says this in Corinthians. Paul says, but I, brothers, he says, I could not address you as spiritual people. It's an indictment. I couldn't address you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. I had to go back. I wanted to address you like spiritual people, but basically what I had to do is say A, B, C, and try to get you to be able to talk because you're still a baby. In 1 Corinthians 2, 6, he says it this way. Yet among the mature... We impart wisdom. Those who are growing, we give them wisdom. Although it's not a wisdom of this age, not, not a wisdom of the world or the rulers of this age, because see, they're all doomed to pass away. Paul says, I address you like infants because that's what you are, but to the mature, I gave forth wisdom, and you profited from that wisdom. So as you're listening to the sermon, you try to piece these things together. When truth is given, is it profitable? Do you grow? Do you know God better? Do you understand the truth better? Are you just trying to bide your time to get on to the next thing? And you're, you're like, when can we get out of this room? The contrast in Corinthians and in Hebrews is spiritual people, that's people who are growing, believers, in contrast with babies, immature and not growing, thus not born, unbelievers. Now, Paul says, no, <laughs> yeah, I did it to myself there. The writer of Hebrews says, <laughs> Hebrews 6, 1 through 3, he says, we need to move on. Now, I just want to call, this is just a short point. 
I want to move on because I want everybody in the church to grow. I certainly want you to understand about repentance. I want you to know you've got to have faith in Jesus Christ. I want you to understand you need to be baptized by immersion and say, I belong to Jesus Christ. I, I certainly want you to understand these things. I, I want you to be set apart for the ministry. I want you to believe in the resurrection of the dead. And I want you to know that there's a judgment coming. Yes, I want you to know those things. But I don't want to teach those same things every week for 20 more years. I also want to teach about some other things. I want to teach Ecclesiastes 5 on Wednesday afternoon because it's important for us to know that when you, you go to the house of God, you ought to guard your steps. I want, I want you to know something about Genesis. I want you to know about Jeremiah. I want you to know about the book of Revelation. I want you to know the whole council. So we need to move on and we have to grow. And so some teaching, sometimes I say something you're like, I don't even understand that. That's all right. We're growing together. And one day you'll understand and you'll grow and you'll grow and you grow because that's the nature of the word. It's full. It's deep. It's rich. Sometimes things are preaching you're like, amen, 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 amen. Sometimes it's preaching you're like, I'm not putting it together yet. That's the challenge. It ought to be happening like that in order that we can all prosper. Why? Because we're being brought to maturity and we want that. Amen. And if not... Then we have a room full of babies waiting on a bottle. And not being, you know, funny in that, that's what he's saying in this text. Now, the emphatic warning is in verses 4 through 8. 4 through 8. I'm going to do them backwards. Uh, I'm going to do 7 and 8 uh, before 4 through 6. But look at 7 and 8, and then we'll work backwards through that. For land that has drunk the rain that often falls on it and produces a crop useful to those for whose sake it is cultivated, they receive a blessing from God. But, it's the contrast, if it bears thorns and thistles, well, it's worthless. It's near to being cursed, and cursed yet, but it's real close. Well, in the end, it is to be burned. So 7 and 8, verses 7 and 8, put the passage in the context of fruit production. That's our context. When we go back to 4 through 6 and we look at enlightenment and tasting and sharing, we're in the context of fruit production. Now this illustration has the same substance falling on the ground. Rain falls on the ground. It's not a difference in what's coming down. It's the same way in the interpreter's house and in this room. The same thing comes out of the pulpit and it falls on everybody in the room. Everybody on the internet, whatever. It, it's the same thing that falls, but there's different productions coming out. There's some, there's no production, which is a production of thorns and thistles. Then there's production of fruit, which you'd find in Galatians. You have the, the, the fruits of the Spirit there. And so you see this type of production and this type of production, but remember, it's from the same falling upon them. If you want to just categorize it as the gospel, the gospel comes down and some produce fruit for the glory of God and some produce thorns and thistles to their own condemnation. But the fault is not in the rain. The fault's not in the gospel. Now, this type of analogy, fruit production, is common in the New Testament. And you'll remember these. I'm not going to read them out. I'm just going to set them before you. And you should remember these at least a little bit. In Matthew 3... 8 through 10, he says, bear the fruit of repentance. Every tree that does not bear good fruit, well, it's cut down and it's thrown in the fire. That's the way Jesus would say it, okay? Matthew 7, he said it like this. Matthew 7, he would say, you will recognize them by their fruit. So the message comes, John the Baptist preaches, Jesus preaches, and here it comes. You got in John several times, they believe, they believe, and it's a spurious belief, it's a false belief, it's a pseudo belief. And then you got some that really believe, and you're like, I don't know who the believer and who the unbeliever is in John. It's like so many people are believing, but which ones is it real? You'll know. You'll know right after. 
after the guy at the pool of Bethesda gets healed. Because all those that once said they believed, now they're all mad. Then you're going to see it again when the blind man gets his sight. And these people that believe got mad. Then you're going to see it again because they're going to pick up stones to kill him. They're going to pick up stones to kill him. They're going to pick up stones to kill him. And there's this other group that's going to follow him and follow him and follow him. You say, oh, now I see them. Because I see their fruit. Their fruit of fellowship discipleship, adherence to the Word of God, Christ. Oh, now I see it, and these went this way. Yes, now you know. Now you know. Matthew 12, 33. Out of the good heart brings out good fruit. That's what comes out of a good heart is good fruit. Out of the evil heart brings forth evil. It, you can't Hide it forever. You can mask it. You can be charading it around however you want to try to get it across to full people. But what's in here, given the right moment and the right circumstance, it will come out. Look, if everything's rosy and good and you got your nice Sunday to go to meet and clothes on and you say, Jesus, Holy Spirit, and there's three people in the Godhead, great. That's great. But... When COVID strikes your house, when you lose your job, when we get a corrupt government ruling over us, when all these things happen and a tornado comes through and burns down your house, if you get enough pressure, you get the right thing to happen, what's in there will come out. You want to make it a less graphic issue? When your spouse rubs you the wrong way. She said it. She didn't do it. He said it. He didn't do it. And men, every time they say Okay, what's in here? It's going to come out. So as you grow as a Christian, I assure you, first year of marriage, there's a lot of stuff coming out of this heart through these lips in my marriage in that first year because I was an absolute idiot written that. I know. But there ought to be growth in the Christian life. And husbands ought to be responding to wives differently after 20 years of marriage. And wives ought to be responding differently to husbands after 25 years of marriage. And children ought to be responding differently to parents after they've lived in the home for 16 years. If they're Christian, there's growth in maturity and how they respond matures. Amen. Amen. Want to make it about the church? How you respond and act in the church comes out differently over the years as you mature. You know what used to make me mad in church? You don't have time. And most of those things I would be mad about just like that, I, first of all, I don't even remember what they are. But maturity says, you know what? That really is not that important. Maturity says, I can overlook that because he has a soul. It ought to be growth. It's what's being said in Hebrews. Now, and in these other fruit-bearing passages, Speaking about people who prove that they are infants, unbelievers, and mature, genuine believers. Now, these are the three words people baffle about all the time. I don't make them as simple as I know how to make them. This word, enlightened. Look back in 4 through 6. We'll read it and be done. For it is impossible. That's the governing factor of the first part of the phrase. What's impossible will come up in verse 6. So impossible in the case of those once enlightened, Tasted the heavenly gift. You see the word, tasted the heavenly gift, say amen. amen. Okay, well then we're defined what that gift is in verse 5. Tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the age to come. That's what's being tasted. So they've been enlightened, they've tasted, and in verse 4, they've shared in the Holy Spirit. Verse 6, those that have had that happen, and then they've fallen away. Okay, now we're back to it's impossible. Impossible to what? To restore them again to repentance. Since they are crucifying once again the Son of God to their own harm and holding Him up to contempt. Enlightened. Made aware of. A light bulb comes on. This is right. This is wrong. This is true. This is false. You can sit in this room today. The interpreter can give you this passage and you can be enlightened. You can come to the awareness of things from this passage. You can learn something from this passage. You can be enlightened to it. But enlightenment does not mean that you partook. I'll make it very simple for you. You go to a restaurant you've never been to before. They hand you a menu. You open the menu. And you're enlightened to what they serve in the restaurant. You look through the dinner selection. Oh, they have this, they have this, they have this, and they have this. It doesn't mean you ate it. You were just enlightened. You're aware of it. And you know 
it's true, right here it says steak. And right here it says frog legs. I thought I'd throw that one in. It, it, it's got it right here. And so I know they have it, but it does not mean that you ate it or partook of it. This word simply is used in this sense. To enlighten is learning in general. Learning in general. John 1, 9. 1 Corinthians 4, 5. In regards to the final judgment. You can be enlightened that in the end there's going to be a final judgment. You're going to have to give account for your life. And you're sitting there and going, what? I'm going to be judged? Yes, you're going to be judged. By the thrice holy God, you're going to be judged. And you're going to give an account for your life on judgment day. You're enlightened. That does not mean you're saved. It just means you've been made aware that there's a judgment to come. Or enlightened in regards to Christian growth. This morning, as we're in this room, I'm unfolding this. And you can at least say, you know what? Christians ought to grow. That don't mean you are. It just means you're enlightened that that's what Christians ought to be doing. They should be maturing. You're enlightened to it, but it does not mean it's a reality for you as an individual. Let me put it this way. The Greek word enlightened is not a technical term that means salvation. It just doesn't. It doesn't mean that. It just means you've come to aware of certain truths. Now, there's something attached to the words hapox, the Greek word hapox, which means once. Now, you can't get anything from this word except what? That it happened one time. Now, did it happen one time on one occasion? Did it happen one time and you were in a church for a year and during that one time at church over that year you were enlightened? I have no idea when it started. I have no idea when it stopped. I don't know if it was quick, long. I have no time barriers here. All I know is there's people that go to church and they're enlightened. They become aware of these truths. That's what he's saying. It happens all the time. The next word is taste. It's used twice to experience something, to come to know something. It's a little bit similar in the sense of coming to a certain amount of knowledge. Now, this heavenly gift that they taste is defined as the Word of God and the powers to come. They taste of God's Word. The taste of it. it. There's people in this church currently that do the memory verse who are unconverted. We memorize scripture and we can quote it, but we, we're not even, we haven't repented, believed, or been baptized. We, we tasted it, but it don't mean it's a reality in our hearts. Let me give you an example from scripture. Jesus was offered wine to drink mixed with gall. Remember that crucifixion scene, right? He's, he's offered that and he tasted it, but he wouldn't drink it. Tasted but wouldn't drink. You can taste the Word of God. There's lost people all over the world that are getting comfort and encouragement from verses out of context that they rip out of the Old Testament, even out of the New Testament, and they apply them to their lost state and they feel better. Just because you taste it, it's like that tastes pretty good does not mean it's taken up residence in your heart. They tasted of it, but they did not drink it down. In this context, it has to be figurative. We're not talking about real drink, and we're not talking about real food. We're talking about spiritual things. So it has to be figurative sense. And so as I think about this idea of it being a figurative sense, the false brethren tasted. False people within a local assembly taste. There are literally people that have come to this church and churches all across the land, Jonathan's Church, Jeff's Church, Jonathan's Church, all these churches, and they've come into church. That boy can preach. Man, that's good, man. That fired me up, man. I had goosebumps when he... And they do that. And they taste it. They may even clap and say amen. Maybe they even gave an offering. They tasted of it. And it really, it really just, man, it just made me feel better. That doesn't mean you were converted. You just tasted of it. They got the flavor. And like, man, God's word is good. And then they was in a, a difficult situation and they used the verse and it helped them through it. And they're like, wow, that was good. Still doesn't mean that they received that word into their heart and it's real. They've tasted. They've experienced its power. Look, there are people and they look and they say, wow, look what happened in that guy's life. My brother John was sharing his testimony in Sunday school this morning. And I'm sure there was people that saw him as an unconverted pastor. And then they saw him get converted. And then they saw his life after conversion. And they're like, wow, man, the word of God's powerful. And then, then, I mean, 
good night. Later. Somebody looked at Cody and said, what happened to this dude, right? I mean, he was this, and now he's this. And you're like, oh my, man, the Word of God's powerful. Yeah, but that don't mean you have it. They've observed, they've tasted of it in the lives of other people. And they're like, wow, that God really changed you. That's great. But what about you? Just because you appreciate it in others doesn't mean it's been real for you. In other words, if you went back to John 6, they tasted, but they have not eaten of his flesh and they have not drank of his blood. Right? Share it. Sharing in the Holy Spirit. Sharing, it's a very short definition. Sharing, participating in. It can imply a very close participation or it can apply a loose association. Okay, Not sure which way we go. Context determines that. And so here, I'm saying it's a loose association. Now this happens. Now, I don't want to misapply things to the Spirit, but I'm saying that this happens in church life. Lost people can come to a church for a while. Now, they feel like they're sharing in the Holy Spirit. Maybe it's a powerful singing church. They got really talented singers. And when the singing, the music, and the lights all go, they get goosebumps on their arm. And man, wow! It was so good! It was right there in the presence of God. Man, it had goosebumps and everything. What was the truth that was preached? I don't know, but I just felt the Lord. Okay? That's great. I don't know how you're going to change your life based on feeling. I, I shared in it. And I, man, I got caught up in the preacher's sermon and I was saying, Amen. And I clapped. And I was patting my foot. And I thought I was at a Gaither concert. <laughs> it was good. Shared in it. Yeah, I say that about that. People do it at the Reformed Church, too. You know all these people flocking all over Mark Driscoll? Oh, Mark Driscoll's the next guy like he's sent from heaven or something. Where, anybody talk about that guy anymore? Where's the guy at? So we get caught up in it. Oh, man, it moved me because he, he... Man, did you hear his teaching on Solomon? Don't ever listen to him. Read John Owen, you'll be saved. They share. Let me give you another word from Hebrews. Sorry about that. I was chasing my head to kill that thing. Hebrews 3 earlier about this word sharing. This is what he says. Let's be real. We have come to share in Christ. <laughs> share in the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. We've come to share in Christ. If indeed. To, are, we share, are you sharing in the Spirit this morning? Are you sharing in Christ? Well, yeah. Well, if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the very end. Then you're sharing. If you're sharing in the Holy Spirit and you're sharing in Christ, here's an absolute truth from the preaching of God's Word. You can't be lost. You can't be snatched out of Jesus' hand. You can't be snatched out of the Father's hand. You will persevere to the end and He will never lose one of His sheep. You will hold your confidence that Christ alone is enough. You'll be satisfied in Him and you'll do so until you die. If that's true of you, when you die and they put you in the coffin, you'll say, here's a man, here's a woman that shared in Christ. Here's a man or woman who shared in the spirit of the living God. Now, if you get goosebumps and emotions and get stirred up and then move on and you don't have these things to the end, then yeah, you shared, but you did not participate in the sense of genuine salvation that God gives. All right. Now, those things, enlightened, tasted, and shared. Now, he says about them in verse 6. And then they've fallen away. Now, be cautious. At least help me to be cautious. Time frames are not here. I've seen people leave churches and be gone for a while and leave the Lord for a while. I've seen people repent and be restored. Just because someone, so somebody here today leaves, it doesn't mean they're never coming back. Okay? But they may not. And that ought to bother you. Yeah. They may leave and never return. Because if they fall away, according to God's definition of fall away, then it's impossible to renew them again unto repentance. It can't be done. They're hopeful that some goes away, people turn, people getting caught in sin, it happens. 
hopeful they repent, hopeful for restoration, but the danger exists that you could turn away and never be brought back. Interesting thing, this word fall away, parapipto is the Greek word, make a mistake. Make a mistake how? In the sense to fail to follow through on a commitment. Commit myself to Christ, but I don't follow through with that commitment. Fall away. In another word, apostasy. I made this commitment. I made this profession. I made this attendance. I was enlightened. I tasted and I shared. And I, had, I was all in for six months, for a year, for two years. But I just gave up. Went on my own way. Fall away. See, there are still people today, even in this room, that are made aware of the truth. They taste the benefits of the truth. Even committing to certain truths. They share in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, yet after a period of time, I'm done. These people, they may walk an aisle. They may repeat a prayer. They may go through a salvation class. They may even get baptized. They may even give their testimony. And they may even become a member of a local church. These things happen, but it's not a problem with the gospel. So here's the fear, or the concern I have. We look at people who fall away. They came, they did whatever it was they did. They got baptized, they confessed, they did whatever, and they go away. And we're like, man, what's up with that? Well, what's up with that is a lack of the gospel being received into the heart. Why? Because if the gospel is really there, they cannot turn away and stay away. It's impossible. Right. But if they can stay away, it's because salvation never occurred. It's not because they lost something, because salvation cannot be lost. Yeah, yeah. It's a problem with the human heart. It's the inability for men to read other men's hearts perfectly. And simply, it can be errors made. We present people as Christian because they said they were Christian. But only time and church and the relationship will prove that out. The Lord's given us a local church and all the New Testament. We write letters to local churches. Membership, discipline. That's what he's given to the church. We have membership line where you can be held accountable. That if you walk away, say, where are you? Where are you? Where are you? Where are you? If you don't return, you're going to be removed from membership. You're going to take your name off the roll because we have to. Because you're proving yourself to be apostate. And so if you walk away and never return, you don't just stay inevitably a member of the church. That's why we have church discipline. That's why we confront people. That's why we call people to repentance. Because if they're really Christian, they'll repent. And they'll come back, and they'll be restored, and they'll be full of joy, and one day they'll have somebody else who's in sin. This is what, that's how the way you can have a meaningful church. If there's no membership, just live however you want. It don't matter because you don't know who you are anyway. Right? right? I mean, you, you just do whatever because there's no, there's no parameter. It, we can have a local church that was purchased by the blood of Christ. We have a membership in order that we can live out the New Testament. No time element. Just keep that in mind. How long someone is gone. It's just a matter of whether or not they come back. It does happen. People do return and are repentant. However, I don't want to minimize the warning. Some fall away and they never return. And I know many of them personally and it breaks my heart. I remember my good friend, my wife's good friends sat at a table at 10 o'clock at night in Plano, Texas, looking straight down. And I said, if you do not repent, you're going to go to hell. And he said, yep, I know. And he got up and walked out. I'm gone. I'm done. He was a youth minister for years. I'm like, how? But people fall away and they never return. There can be no guarantee that a person will return. That's why this warning matters. You're, look, you're falling away may be the ceiling of your own fate. Can't be renewed, can't be restored. But what else? How, how could you be restored? If you walk away from the gospel, if you walk away from the truth of the word, how can you be restored? We don't have anything else. All I have is a gospel in this word. If you're rejecting this, you can't be restored. It's not like, oh, well, he rejects the Bible, we'll use the Quran. That's not working. <laughs> well, he rejects the Bible, so we'll just use group therapy. This, no, this, if you reject this, there's nothing else to be 
restored with. You reject the gospel, you reject Christ, you can't be restored with Buddha. There's no way of restoration. All you're doing, if you claim to be a Christian and walk away, you're just offering Christ up in contempt and you're saying, what he did for me was not enough. And here's what people say. Oh, I did all that. I did that. I went to church. I got baptized. I did all that. And it didn't work for me. You're holding Christ up in contempt. Don't dare tell me Christ wasn't able to make you right. Don't dare tell me that the gospel's not sufficient. That's contempting unto the Lord. This gospel is effective. It's a mockery. You can't use Christ as a good luck charm. You can't use him as a genie in a bottle. You don't jump when you holler. It's all about fruit production here. So we come back to where we started, verses 7 and 8. When the gospel is truly received, when there is a true partaking, there will be fruit produced that will be beneficial. Now, lastly... That's one group, in my view, is the verses 4 uh, through 8 is talking about those and everything that I've tried to explain. And now, an encouraging word, quickly, an encouraging word, verses 9 through 12. Now, though we speak in this way, yet in your case, beloved, you see the switch? Mm -hmm. Enlighten, taste it, share, fall away, can't be restored. But in your case, beloved, are you one of the beloved? We, we feel sure, absolute confidence of better things. You know what things? Things that belong, it's the first time you saw the word. Things that belong to salvation. We're confident. For those who are saved, there's much better things. Their things were going away near to being cursed and being burned. Okay, but there's much better things for you. Those of you who have salvation. Verse 10. For God is not unjust. He's not. He's not like going to overlook your work. He's not going to overlook your work and the love that you have shown for his name in serving the saints. Everything you do in the local church for brothers and sisters in Christ and praying and giving and serving and working and laboring, crying and rejoicing, all those things we do together, God sees it all. He never overlooks any of it, dear saints. Look, Christian, just keep on working. Keep on serving. Keep on investing into the local body of Christ. Just live like that till Jesus comes. There are better things for you. God will never overlook your labor of love. That you're doing for His name. And He goes, as you still do. That's what mature people do. Infants go, well, I did that back in 1962. Okay, I preached a sermon in 1974. What did you do? They don't give me a pass. We keep serving. We still do. We keep serving our church. Hey, you weren't here Wednesday night we were talking about you. I'll just tell you straight out. You make a commitment to the church. You go and you go through a new membership class. And you say, I'll be faithful in attendance. I'll be faithful in participation. I'll give. I'll serve. And you sign your name on it. Half of you can't find you in Sunday school the last two years. You haven't been to Wednesday night prayer meeting in so long. You don't even know we have it. What, what is all of that? You're supposed to serve until the end. Right? You serve to the end. Just keep on giving. Be on, don't be like Christian. Can we move on from hence? I went Sunday morning. Isn't that enough? I saw one room. There's another room. You missed it. He goes on, verse 11. Listen to him. We desire each one of you, every one of you, to show the same earnestness to have the full assurance of hope until the end so that you may not be and there's our word we started with in verse 11 of chapter 5 we don't want you to be sluggish we don't want you to be lazy just be imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises better things inheritance of the promises you'll inherit them because the Christian is sealed with the Holy Spirit until the day of redemption You'll inherit all those promises. What a joy, what a privilege. Don't be sluggish. God knows your life. He knows your work. He knows your love. He knows your servants, service and your perseverance. By the way, just a little short side note if you can. I grew up in churches that I don't know who I was supposed to imitate. And if I did, I'm not sure so how well that would work out for me. I had a deacon that stood out in front of the church and smoked cigarettes. 
His wife was my Sunday school teacher. She committed suicide by drowning herself in the bathtub. I had youth ministers, two couples, and somewhere in the youth ministry, they switched partners and became adulterers. I, I had all, I mean, I had, what am I supposed to imitate in this setting? Right? But I want to say to you, church, you don't have an excuse. There's people here you can imitate. Yeah. Here, here's my son. Go imitate my son. He got moved out, got his own house, lives by himself. But he's still Sunday school, still church, still here Wednesday. Just imitate him. He's a young man trying to follow Jesus. There's Tony. Tony's been here 752 years. He's always faithful. He's always here. He's always praying. He's always giving. He's all, then just follow him. You've got examples. There's women in this church. Man, follow Miss Sharon around. When it's snowing and sleeping and it's dark and she can't see, she drives the church on Wednesday night where she can be at prayer meeting. And when she can't see no more, she said, Brother David, will you come pick me up? I want this church. You've got examples in the room that you can grow from because there's some people here eating meat. I have to be done. I know you're ready to get out of the room. Do you remember the beginning of the story? We're in the interpreter's house. We have Christian, and we're seeing these rooms. Well, he showed Pilgrim this room, and it contained a man in an iron cage. The teaching of this room came from the passage that we've looked at this morning. Christian asked the man in the iron cage how he came into this condition. The man in the iron cage said, I left off to watch and be sober. I laid the reins upon the neck of my lust. I sinned against the light of the word and against the goodness of God. I grieved the spirit of God and he is gone. I tempted the devil and he has come to me. I have provoked God to anger and he has left me. I have so hardened my heart that I cannot repent. Christian, ask him if there is any hope for him. Sir, is there any hope for you? And the man in the iron cage says, no, none at all. God hath denied me repentance. His word gives me no encouragement to believe. Yea, himself has shut me up in this iron cage, nor can all the men in the world let me out. Oh, eternity! Oh, eternity! How shall I grapple with the misery of eternity? Interpreter says, Let this man's misery be remembered by thee and be an everlasting caution to thee. You say, well, John, the story story's an allegory. That's not scripture. Okay, fine. There's a man, and he went to the prophet, and he said, I sinned. I've done wrong, I'm out of line, and I need to be made right with God. And the prophet says, I can't help you. God hath rejected you, and there's nothing I can do for you. His name was Saul. The prophet's name was Samuel. You say, well, that's Old Testament stuff. People don't like the Old Testament. People don't like the Old Testament are Christian. Look, you want it from the New Testament? Esau sought repentance with tears, and he was denied. Judas tried to repent, took back the 30 pieces of silver and handed it back, and it didn't do nothing for his conscience, so he committed suicide by hanging himself. This room, this passage, please listen and I'll be done. The fear, the concern I have for people who have been enlightened, tasted, and shared. You can walk out that door this morning and the Spirit of God can depart from you and never return. I don't know whether it will happen today or not. I just know that it happens. And if the Spirit of God departs from you, you can't repent. Because repentance is a gift from God. You can't muster it up and you can't work it up. If the Spirit of God is speaking to you today to repent, to believe, to throw all of yourself in and say, I'm with Christ, then do it today. Believe on Christ today. Right now, this moment, say, I'm done. I believe Christ because you may never, ever have the opportunity again, even if you come to this church the rest of your life. Because if the Spirit of God is gone, there is no conversion. Christian says, 
This is his response. This is fearful. God help me to watch and be sober and to pray that I may shun the cause of this man's misery. It is fearful. I pray that you will take these things seriously. You want to, you say, well, what about us Christians? Take it seriously. Your children in your own home, your grandchildren in your own home, this may be the last opportunity they get. Don't play around with that. Your neighbor, your coworker, this may be their last opportunity. Don't be flippant with the gospel. Pray for them in earnest. The next time you speak to them, maybe the last time the Spirit of God visits them. Should bother us. Don't be content that people are unconverted. Don't be content that people reject the gospel. May it bother you. May it keep you awake at night. May the names of people in this church keep you awake at night because they haven't repented and they haven't believed and they may never believe. They're going to spend eternity in hell. It's what's going to happen. And they're going to be under the judgment and the wrath of God for all of eternity. That's not trivial. Don't let familiarity bring contempt in you. It should bother you that people are dying without Christ, even in our own homes. And we should labor more in prayer, seeking the Spirit of God to do what only He can do. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. Brother Jeff, 